early blastmasis stage. So the separation is at the early blastmasis stage. Now these twins, so if you hear the blastmasis, and what happens is the inner cell mass splits into two, and you end up with two blastmasis. So they'll split uh, kind of in this stage, some before the seven-day period, somewhere in here. These twins are genetically identical. However, they're mirror image. So in, there's like examples where one would be right-handed, the other would be left-handed. The best example of that is in tennis, the Byron twins, I think they're called. They're the best, one of the best men's doubles tennis group in the world. They are mirror image twins. One is left-handed, one's right-handed. And in doubles and tennis, having a left-handed, right-handed partner is the ideal scenario. They have to be twins, genetically identical. One's left-handed, one's right-handed. And they're one of the best doubles team in the world. So the point is, that's a great example of them being genetically identical, but having real differences in other areas. So that's what they call mirror image. If the split occurs even later, you can have co-joined twins. So just envision this, this split coming much later. Then you get the equivalent of what used to be called Siamese twins, right? They're co-joined. And there's some very notable examples. Uh, there's, I think there's a co-joined mirror image. What they are is mirror image twins that don't separate. And there's an example, I think, in Minnesota somewhere, where uh, some girl has two well, amounts of two heads. And uh, one head controls one side of the body, the other head controls the other side of the body. But obviously, you can't split them apart because you, you would die. So they, they stay together um, is, is in this situation. But all they are is a very late splitting mirror image twin, is all that is. Okay? And again, any identical twin, whether it's a, a real identical twin or a mirror image twin, one fertilization, one zygote. Returnal twins, two fertilizations, two different zygotes form. Okay? Any questions on twinning? No, can mirror image twins be the same sex? No, because they're genetically identical. Genetically identical. Which example? Yeah. The question is about women getting pregnant a month or two after they're pregnant. Oh, that's not clear. The birth would be a very good question. The birth can be quite dangerous because you've got another one in there. My guess is they, my guess is they probably go use cesarean to take out the first baby and let the other develop. I don't know how they handle it exactly medically. But there are rare examples. So those of you getting into the med school later on, you might actually see something like that. Okay, yes, question. Say this again. Oh, the more twins, yeah, let me, thank you. Um, let me preface this by saying, um, if you correct for in vitro fertilization, there's a, there's a massive increase in fraternal twins and identical twins also when the mom is late 40s. Starting about mid 40s, there's a much higher level of that. I have in my own family fraternal twin aunts and uncles and fraternal twin great aunts and great uncles. And both, in all example, and my cousin also has twins, and I have twins. And in all cases, the mom was over 40 years old, all four cases. That's anecdotal, but it is true. If you correct for in vitro fertilization, that's one reason why the twin levels go way up recently. When they implant in vitro fertilization, they implant viable blastocysts. And the techniques are so much better that more than one usually survives. So I had uh, some friends went in for that and ended up with triplets because three of the four they implanted survived. So if you correct for those numbers, there's an increase in part because women are being more, reproduc being more reproductively viable at a later age these days, for whatever reason. Also, women on fertility drugs can have pop out many secondary oocytes. They'll ovulate more than one. Therefore, the rates go up higher there, too. And you know, fertility, fertility drugs are not that old, 20, 30 years they've been using them. So that's why you might see more twins now than in the old days. Also, very frankly, it's probably just good, better medical care. In the old days, not the good old days, the old days, um, women giving birth to twins you know, was, was dangerous. And these days, you can, you can do better surgical things. In my case, one of my twins was reached coming down feet first. So they, they, they had to you know, do a cesarean for that. But the point is, in the old days, there might have been some survivability issues, but not as much anymore. So that's another reason, too. There's a lot of interesting stats. And those of you going to med school will see a lot of this uh, fairly directly, okay, as medicine gets better. Okay, any other questions? Yes, in the back. Oh, what happens when they absorb? That can happen. Um, a lot of times it's a case where you have triplets and you know, quintuplets, and they might, women might absorb two or three of them. They get absorbed in and then get sloughed out, but usually it's absorbed, you know, it's degraded. It's not viable, usually. And the tissue is degraded, and you use amino acids and everything that gets uh, taken up. Yeah, your body's pretty good at doing stuff like that. I mean, all of our bodies are. I mean, it's, it's to use recycling, basically, the amino acids and proteins and everything. Same thing with the polar body. Okay, and sometimes they get pushed out, but sometimes not. Sometimes it you know, gets used. Okay, very good question. All right, so let's, uh, so we're done with twinning. Let's talk about pregnancy hormones. And we touched on this uh, with twinning. Um, I'll leave that up there. As I mentioned, during the, you have three trimesters, i.e., the name, trimester. And for the hormones, the placenta is extremely important in hormone production. In fact, many of our hormones were first isolated by taking placenta and figuring out what's in there. So the placenta is huge, by the way. I've seen, all, I've seen all four of my kids being born, and the placenta always amazes me on the sheer size of this thing. And by the way, I've cut all four umbilical cords, too, so that was always good. So the HCG keeps the corpus luteum. Going. What does the corpus luteum make? Estrogen plus progesterone. That does several things. Estrogen plus progesterone inhibits LH and FSH in the interior pituitary, so you don't want more follicle development. But it also enhances a protein called, a hormone called prolactin. And prolactin's role, one of the roles of prolactin, is to start stimulating the mammary gland. The reason is at birth, you want to produce milk, which the mammary gland does. And prolactin comes in, binds to a receptor on the mammary gland, and helps, helps the developmental process. In addition, estrogen, whoops, estrogen plus progesterone also helps the development of the mammary gland. In addition, the placenta makes another hormone called CS for chorionic somatomammotropin. And this also plays a role, I'll put this forward up here, plays a role in mammary gland development. So this is during, this, all this is occurring during the first trimester. I would say first trimester is the board above. Okay? So the placenta makes CS and makes HCG. At the end of the first trimester, HCG goes away, the corpus luteum breaks down. And the placenta picks up the, the rest of the estrogen plus proge progesterone. So in trimesters two and three, the placenta makes estrogen plus progesterone to inhibit LH and FSH and to stimulate prolactin. And estrogen plus progesterone and CS goes down to the mammary gland. So in the second, third trimesters, it is the placenta does all the heavy lifting in terms of estrogen plus progesterone. So if you look at the time frame, 
This is the placental hormones. HCG comes up and down. This is the first trimester. And then estrogen plus progesterone goes way up. And the placenta, being an actually huge organ, makes a ton of estrogen plus progesterone. And it's also why morning sickness tends to go away after the first trimester because HCG goes away. And that's why morning sickness tends to end. You ask your moms about that. It can last a little longer. Can, some women are not affected at all by it. But so kind of the average majority are most definitely affected by it. It's a real phenomenon. Okay, questions on that? Yes? Wait, say it again. Right? I don't know why people eat placentas. I truly don't. Um, the only hormones that would get through would be the steroids. All the protein hormones would break down by the acid in your stomach. So that is why female contraceptives are steroids. You can take them and eat them, right? And they get through your digestive system. All the protein hormones would break down. The, the placenta is full of nutritious stuff. I mean, there's amino acids. I mean, it's a very metabolically rich organ. And um, don't know, I, can't, I can't tell you the value. I have no idea what the value might be to humans. The only value I can see in it personally is freezing them down and saving the stem cells for later on. If your kid, you know, later on, 24 years from now, the stem cell technology gets much better. There are stem cells in the placenta. And there's you know, things like that. But that's the only reason I would think to, to keep it personally. That's my own personal choice. I have no idea why some people do that. Okay? So, right over here? Is there a hormone what? Oh, it causes the weird food cravings. Which hormone causes weird food cravings? That I don't know. Thinking about all the hormones that are produced, there's a lot of different hormones going on during pregnancy. It's not just these. These are the main ones. It probably affects uh, you know, your, your, your appetite and so forth. And also the feeling is you're eating for more than one person. There's probably some sense, some instinctual sense there that you want to eat more also. But I don't know which hormone is exactly creating the appetite. People might know. I'll look that up. Yes? Oh, after the first trimester, the corpus luteum dissipates, uh, gets digested, and it just basically it degrades. It becomes amino acids and proteins and so forth. Yes? Same thing after each menstrual cycle also. All right? Other questions? So then, the upper board. This is the first trimester, defined by HCG in the presence of the corpus luteum. Second and third trimesters are defined by not having a corpus luteum. By the third trimester, a woman would know if they're pregnant. Okay? Second trimester could be a little iffy sometimes. Yes? It's not negative feedback. You've got to understand the difference. This is inhibition. There's a big difference. Now, yes, you want to maintain an inhibition of LH so you do not get follicle development while you're pregnant. See right here? So, so the F knocking out FSH and LH prevents follicle development during pregnancy. No, it's exactly the same mechanism in terms of the, ov the uh, ovaries concern. No. Uh, you, have, you have estrogen plus progesterone. Estrogen plus progesterone is coming from the placenta instead of the corpus luteum. That's all. It passes it off from one organ to the other. But the reason is the placenta is huge. And you can make a lot more estrogen plus progesterone. A woman will have more estrogen plus progesterone during pregnancy than at any other point in time. It's much, much higher than during the menstrual cycle. Yes? Uh, is there a way of representing negative feedback versus inhibition? No, because I'll tell you when it's inhib inhibition. There is an inhibitory part of negative feedback, but when you get rid of it, when the levels get too low, those arrows with the minus signs disappear. And then that production comes back up. That is not the case with an inhibition. There is no feedback. It's a straight inhibition. Okay, you have to know the system. All right. Then, after all this stuff, it's time for labor. And there are, as you can imagine, labor hormones. So the ovary does make a little bit of estrogen. And this is the uterus. And what the estrogen does is, through the regular steroid pathway, binds the receptor, turns into a transcription factor, makes a receptor for a protein called, I'll put it down here, oxytocin, or for a hormone called, called oxytocin. Oxytocin receptor is a seven-pass transmembrane receptor. does not activate adenylate cyclase, activates other kinds of enzymes. Fossil IKC, but you do not need to know fossil IKC. What happens is the pressure of the head of the baby picks on contractions. And the contractions go to the, let me put this up here. I'll put it down here. Maybe better. The contractions stimulate another endocrine organ called the posterior pituitary. Remember before it was the anterior pituitary? Here you have the posterior pituitary. And this makes a hormone called oxytocin, which is a peptide, actually, or it's a protein hormone. And oxytocin then binds to the oxytocin receptor and kicks on more contractions. And the contractions kicks on more production of oxytocin, which then kicks on more contractions. Classic positive feedback. Secondly, oxytocin also, I'll put the board back up, binds to receptors in the placenta. And the placenta produces another hormone called prostaglandin. Prostaglandin. And prostaglandins binds also another 7-pass membrane receptor, which also helps with the contractions. So let's look at this positive feedback system. Pressure of the head comes down, kicks on oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary secretes oxytocin, which has two effects. Binds to the receptor on the uterus, induces more contractions. In addition, oxytocin binds to the receptors on the placenta, produces another hormone called prostaglandins, which also binds to its receptor on the uterus, and the two together kick on more contractions. More contractions kick on even more oxytocin, which even more contractions. Positive feedback until the baby's born. Questions? Yes? Other countries? Yeah, well, I don't know if you're here, but um, people like stop people ingest oxytocin and people get depleted. Like, oh, yeah, I, I, too much of anything is not good in these kinds of systems. Um, I think the, the medicine here, if you're having problems with labor, you can get an oxytocin or an analog of oxytocin that they can inject in to induce labor. I don't know what goes on in other countries, as you part of your question, but I would imagine the dose, like anything else, is really important. And I also, women react differently to different doses, too. Yes, question. What causes the baby's head to like, kick up? Like, what starts the whole The pressure of the head in the birth canal, as it comes engaged, it's called, you don't have to know this, it comes down in, and there's, a, it's, there's physical contact between the head and the wall, and that kicks on. The initial sets of contractions, which then get over time, get bigger and bigger as you kick in this hormonal system. Yeah, the baby moves into place. That's exactly right. That's a very good way of putting it. Yes. Christine, is that your name? Okay. 
Uh, I'm not sure of all the effects. Oxytocin has lots of other effects. Um, I'd have to look up exactly what that is to give you a correct answer. But um, it's a peptide, a very bioactive peptide. It does have other effects in the cell. The, the receptors for oxytocin and for prostaglandins are seven-pass transmembrane receptors, not unlike glucagon. But oxytocin does not stimulate the cyclase. Prostaglandins, however, do. No, it's, it's a little bit different than that. A little bit different, okay? Also, the tissue, which these hormones have an effect, plays a role in the response. Yes? Uh, C-section, the question is, when they go C-section, um, depends, there's lots of reasons for it. You know, if they're in labor for a long time, you know, there's lots of reasons. In the case of one of my twins, they're coming down breach. There's, there's a difficulty with the, uh, um, you know, viability. Of them. Sometimes they notice the umbilical cord is wrapped around the head or the neck, and they go in there to get the baby's out. There's lots of reasons. It's usually for health of the mom or the baby. Um, actually, of my four kids, three pregnancies, there's one set of twins, they all were born under different circumstances. One was a straight birth, one was an epidural, one was a C-section. The last two were C-sections. So I've seen it all from that point of view. <laughs> I've never, uh, okay? Any other questions? All right, so we didn't get the stem cells. We'll start out Wednesday with stem cells and run through development. So keep all this in mind.